Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Hi. I'm going to welcome everybody for the next few minutes or maybe 45 seconds, and then we're going to get started. If we could all mute ourselves as you enter the room. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Editorializing Lived Experiences. This is creating an authentic voice, an impactful message in professional writing. So welcome, welcome to this session. So who are we and, and what do we do? So, um, again, we're going to ask that everyone stay muted. And before I get into who we are and what we do, so you folks know, uh, this is going to be participatory. It will be. Um, most of the participation is going to be stacked towards the end of the session. But if you need clarification or if anything is unclear, please, please raise your hand through the Zoom or just you know message us or chat. Make it clear that there's something or indicate that you need uh, clarification with some of the writing or, or some of the messages that we're, we're talking about. Also, this is being recorded, so you know. So do whatever you have to do to make that comfortable for you. So whether that's alternating a name or changing a face, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to leave that up to you folks. But do know it's going to be recorded. So with that said, with that said, who are we? What are we talking about? Why are we here? Uh, my name is Max Gutman. Um, I teach or taught or will teach family-oriented therapy. So I teach social work students how to be therapists. Um, I blog on my webpage or blog webpage, mentalhealthaffairs.blog. I also blog for PsychReg, a number of um, sites and mediums out there. My writings and journal articles, I've written a few books. Um, I love to write. I'm all about talking about my lived experience in different mediums. So whether it's journaling, um, newspapers, um, YouTube, my message gets out there. And that's why I'm here. We're talking about how to do that. So, um, Christina, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Christina Bruni. I have a master's in library science, and I'm an author and advocate whose goal is to help individuals live full and robust lives in recovery. I'm a librarian at Brooklyn Public Library with a niche in helping patrons create resumes and conduct job searches. My first book is Left of the Dial, a memoir of schizophrenia, recovery, and hope. And my forthcoming book is Working Assets, a career guide for peers. You can contact me at cb at christinabruni.com and on my website, you can read my working assets blog and print up other career information. A lot of experience. Thank you, Christina. So. Before we meditate and reflect on this quote, I'd like to talk about like why this is important. So think about this, ever watch TV um, or read a newspaper, hear about an emerging story, someone created something, someone's doing something in any field, not just peer work or, or people with lived experience, everyone's got experience. And there are a lot of fields out there. Have you ever noticed that when there's an emerging story, people talk about who they are, where they've come from, stuff that happened in their life? Well, that's happening more and more every day. People are out there telling their stories and it brings more meaning to whatever it is they're creating or they've created and that you're purchasing, you're buying, whether it's a commodity, whether it's a product, people's stories have value. It adds value and meaning to whatever is out there that they're doing, okay? This is why we're here. This is what this is about. It's about taking your story, taking your message, taking your experience, packaging it, okay? And whether you want to think of it as selling it to the public, giving it to the public, I don't, I 
not a businessman. Um, I still have that experience to get. So most of my work is out there, uh, free pro bono, whatever you want to say, I give it away. Um, but I believe that in giving it away information, I believe in free access to information. And with that will come greater things and greater good for people. So that's part of what I do and why I believe in this. So here's a quote to meditate on. I think this will situate what this is all about or how to think of the message piece and the authenticity piece. So Roland Barthes, who is he? He was a literary critic. Um, he said in one of his articles, the birth of the reader must be at the cost, if, if not the death of the author, all right? It was written in this literary thing and, and death of the author in 1968. Literary critics basically take writing, reflect on them and, and write something about them. So that if there's a message that if someone else reads it, creates another message, a lot of messaging, all right? So what does this quote mean to you? The birth of the reader must be at the cost and death of the author. What might that mean? Any ideas? This is that participatory piece. Um, any clues? Could it be something like, you know, every time we read uh, a text, uh, we interpret it in a certain way and this sort of uh, results in the, like, death of the original meaning of the author, our personal interpretation of the text? Yes. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Once something's written, once you put something out there, the author, he's dead, he's gone. All right, it's up to the reader at that point to interpret. It's all about interpretation. But I like to think at least, as someone who knows a little bit about language, that the author's packages it in a certain way, frames that message in a certain way for the reader to come and, and evaluate it, to look at it and say, okay, this is what that might've meant. Because language does have an impact on things and how we frame things, right? And package things is going to impact how someone reads it. But believe you me, once it's out there, it's out there. Okay, people will interpret how they do. You read stories all the time in the newspaper, right? Everyone has their own glee. They get something different from what they read, right? Even the author might have a slant, right? He might have a way of packaging it. But people will interpret how they do. They'll bring their own experience into it. They'll like they'll say, okay, well, this is from what I know about this person. This is bold. You know, and, and, and people do think what they will. We can't stop that. And that's great. That's how this works. And that's why we're all so different. And that's why it's all about bringing our, our authenticity, our authenticity into it. Because when we're real about things, people will, will, will gain more insight into whatever is happening. The, the interpretive eye will widen and there'll be more meaning there for you to get. So anyway. And also in the chat, Wendy has said, you must be willing to risk yourself to be able to bring the reader in and be vulnerable. And that's what I'm seeing in a lot of what I'm write, reading in books and writing is that there are authors who are telling their life stories in other fields like financial activism. Absolutely. And personal style and they're telling their life experiences to make a connection with the reader. Absolutely, that's so true. Um, when we take our lived experience and, and we're vulnerable and we put it out there, we can't, it's indefensible at that point. We, you can't go in and, and, and say, everyone, don't read that, don't read that. You can't stop the papers from flowing. You can't stop the blogs from circulating. They're gonna circulate and you have to be comfortable with who you are and who you said you were. Because at that point, people will take it from there. Oh, they will, believe you, believe me. And I've experienced that myself. I've written several memoirs about my lived experience. I try as much as I can uh, to believe that people will get what I think they'll get out of it, but I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I'll talk about people after they've read my work and they'll, and they'll say, well, Max, uh, you know, yeah, this is this, that, and that, the rest. Like, really? I didn't, I think you'd get that from what I wrote. 
You got that from what I wrote? People get anything. You'd be surprised. You'll be, you, you will be shocked. So be authentic because it doesn't really matter in the end what people are going to think and say and do. It's about being who you were and at least say you put that out there because people are going to do what they wish. So be who you are and, and know that you put your best personal self out there at all times. That's, that's part of what I believe. Um, and an objective, right? Our objectives. What are we going to get out of this? Kind of brief aside. So I'd like everybody to be able to utilize their own lived experience and take at least one approach, one way of framing, one way of packaging things, all right? And knowing how to do that and sort of walk the line of self-disclosure and that, that vulnerability that we talked about. So this could be three pieces, that vulnerability attached to self-disclosure, right? What you're putting out there, how you're putting it out there, and knowing that you at least walked away from this presentation with knowing how to do that in one way, right? So with that said, let's reflect, a little bit more reflection. To do this, I'm gonna have Christina take it away. Okay, self-reflection is important. And we want to know what have you learned from your mistakes or reading about other people's mistakes? What have you learned from your achievements? What have you learned from friends, family, teachers, public figures and others? What have you learned from books and film? And what have you learned from these experiences? Which all tie into formulating your own self-expression. And what are a few clinical interventions that have helped you or not? Meds, therapy, other interventions, non-clinical interventions that have helped or not? Yoga, exercise, spiritual practice, engaging socially, etc., and share what helped you live fully. Let's pause there for a second. It's all about lived experience as a peer, right? We talk about it, we share it, we interact with other people, we learn from our history. That's what this is about, okay? But it's also about how to communicate it. So a part of communication, that packaging piece, right? I said, you're gonna have one takeaway in terms of, a, of, of an approach. Rhetoric is an approach. It's the art of expression, a little term, rhetoric. People like to say, well, that's a bad thing, rhetoric. What is that? You know, they're, they're all about rhetoric being evil and bad. Rhetoric's what you do with it, folks, just like your lived experience. Is lived experience all bad? No, no of course not. There's good experience and bad experiences. There's good rhetoric and bad rhetoric, right? Uh, what, whatever side you're on, whether you're an ally or an access, whether you're fighting a war or communicating a message internally in the country about a political reform. If there's good, there's bad, there's evil. It's who you are and how you interpret it, right? But there's ways of communicating messages. Some folks are better at it than others. Some folks use rhetoric and, and are able to mobilize army some people can't even uh request that um you know they can't even order the right thing at uh, at the drive through right what was that what did you want number four no uh, number five you know like it, it, some people are better at speaking than others so i recommend i recommend that you pick one way and start thinking about a good approach that is working for you this is working for me i noticed that when i speak this way other people are getting the message and build on that, and then maybe pick another approach. So I think we'll just play this little clip, because this is a good example, I thought, of um, from Darkest Hour. It's just a speech. We'll watch it for a second. He's speaking.
could have been given to us. I have myself full confidence that if all do their duty, if nothing is neglected, and the best arrangements are made as they are being made, we shall prove ourselves much more able to defend our island home and ride out the storm of war and to outlive the many tyranny. If necessary, the years, if necessary, I love. Yes, that is what we are again to try to do. That is the result of this majesty's young. That's a great place to stop. See, look, someone, see, just look at where I stop. Someone's listening, right? Do you have any idea what, what she's thinking? No, but she listened to a message, right? That message was spoken. It was heard. Whether you're a, a um, you know, an English fan or a Nazi, right? You may have different ideas of, of you know, whether there's truth to the rhetoric or there's where it's a bunch of bull crap. You know, you don't know. Um, I don't know what you what you're thinking, but everyone's going to interpret it a certain way. Interpretation is everything, but. Is it? Is it? Are there ways of communicating messages where you can sort of uh, lean on that interpretation, where you can influence people and influence ideas? I don't know. There are books out there all the time about it, right? How do you influence the masses? How do you write something that everyone's going to read and love? You know, how do you influence people to buy your book? How do you influence people to listen to your lived experience when you're working with clients, right? Peer specialists. Aren't you telling your story to folks that you're working with? Aren't those folks supposed to buy in, right, quote, to your story and say, hey, hey, you did that? I can do that. You got up and walked? I can get up and walk. You're taking your meds? You're not taking your meds. You know, it's, it's all about what you think and how you communicate the message. If you're convincing or you're not, right? Who are you going to be? Um, how are you going to get and utilize rhetoric, right? The art of persuasion, communication to get that message across. So the question would be: So, is rhetoric an art or a science? It doesn't really make a difference. That question I always found to be uh, somewhat esoteric, right? It, what's a science? What's an art? Um, is could it be both? Are there ways of having art within a science? Ways of right? You're an, you're a science teacher, or you're a peer specialist talking about what you do and how you do it. Is pure work a science? Is there a way, is there an art to it, a flow, right? I don't know. What constitutes as lived experience, right? That's also up to interpretation because some folks might think that, hey, just getting up and living their day is their lived experience because it's difficult and it's hard and they want to share the every day with their, with their people that they're working with. Or maybe it's specific moments. For me, it was 10 years ago, a blip in time, um, maybe a period of six months as my schizophrenia symptoms developed and blossomed. That was my lived experience. After that, everything's just been life. That's the way I see it. That's the way I see it. But the way I see it also impacts how I communicate it to you, right? Doesn't it? The way I understand my own experience is going to impact the message that I give you. These are just ideas, folks. Soak them in. Soak them in. As you develop and think about how you want to share your story, think about the questions that I'm raising. Think about how your story can be shaped and you use your own rhetoric, right? Your own convincing nature of speaking to connect with your clients, right? To, to, to say, hey, look, this is what happened to me. What happened to you? And, and, and have them begin to share their stories. What do you hope to achieve by sharing your story? Ask that question. Is it for people that you work with? Is it that micro work, right? Your clients, your everyday, your, on your caseload? Or is it going to be a broader picture? Do you want to you know, have a message to the world? Say, hey, look, this is a new disease, emerging disease. This is something we got to tackle as a community. 
Is it a community? Is it macro? Is it mezzo? What is it? What's your aim? You have to have an aim because if you don't have an aim, you're sort of floating in, in this, in this quasi strange space where, where the message isn't so clear. Because when the message isn't clear, when people say, well, what the heck is this person talking about? Then you know you got to reframe. Then you know you got to recollect and say, hey, look, well, this is what I meant. As I find this the most difficult piece, okay, of sharing our stories as peers. People think that people with mental illness are confused sometimes. That's just, that's just a thing, all right? They think we're stupid. They think we don't know what, 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 what we're talking about half the time. That's why we're professionalizing what we do and how we speak. So believe you me, when I speak, right, I carry that baggage with me. I know that if I don't speak like a professional, like I know what the, I'm talking about, people aren't going to give a, sh a crap. They're going to think this person's full of crap or this person doesn't know. That's just my stuff. What stuff do you have with you? Do you think that because you have a mental health disorder that, that people aren't going to listen to your story? I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But the fact of the matter is you're going to carry all these questions and these, these vulnerabilities and these, 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 these negative thoughts with you. They're going to play in your mind. And the way you shape your story is going to offset those messages, hopefully creating a bigger message, one that will envelop and take on a life of its own and a story of its own, a story that people buy into. And it won't just be some, some, some whack job, right? Telling you a story. It'll be an important message that the world will hear. Yes. Thank you. All right. So I'll take this one too. So um, how do we talk about our lived experience from medical and mental health disorders, right? This is a little bit of what I was talking about. So I choose a prose approach, not only because I don't like poetry. I just don't. I hate it. Um, you know, of course, I'm so stupid. I don't like it. And I also think that if I tell poetry, people are going to brush it off. That's my thing. That's my baggage. I don't like poetry. But I also believe, right, like I said before, that if I'm not completely linear, linear, right, that if I speak in crazy non sequiturs, people are going to brush me off. They're not going to think my story is worth listening to. So I speak very clinically at times. And sometimes I can be um, very maybe monotone, maybe a little... Um, you know, ABC. I don't skip around. I don't do side stories. I don't do asides because I think people that speak that way, oh, strange, but they're not. But that's my thing. And I take that with me. So it informs my approach is the point. I speak in narratives that are very linear. All my books are stream of consciousness. It's, it's as if you're, you're, you're walking through my thoughts because I think that if I can explain my rationalizations, even though they're bizarre, you'll understand. You tell me, do you still understand them? Some people do, some people don't. The point is that's how I do it. It's because of my lived experience. So what's the best way of getting your story across? What is the content and nature of what you're talking about? So folks, are you talking about mental health stuff? What's your lived experience? You wanna think about the content of your story. What is it that you are sharing? Are you sharing your day-to-day, -day, like I said, or is it everything? You wanna know what the actual lived experience piece is, because that's what you're gonna flush out. That's what people are gonna target and, and, and read when they're reading your work or listening to your speech. You wanna know what it is that they wanna pick up on. Yes, and Philip in the chat has said that he believes telling your story also includes being an example walking the talk. And what I had talked with Max about earlier is that I think in the modern day, no one can really be an authority unless they have experience on the topic they're talking about. So true, so true. That's why I became a social worker. That's why I became a peer specialist because I wanted to professionalize my language. I wanted to take and speak and walk the talk. I wanted to walk among social workers and talk about my lived experience professionally. I wanted to walk amongst peers and say, this is how we do things in the system. And I want to be able to 
and mesh it all together and, and have a package, me, right, and my story, my authentic self, and be that. I didn't want to speak blather, meaningless, meaningless um, language to people that are going to, you know, they're going to be like, all right, all right, so just another peer, just another this, just another that. No, I want it to be that peer who knows the system in and out. Who, who understands the system for what it is, who's written about it, who's become an authority, because that authority is the authenticity piece that I, I'm speaking about. When you're authentic about yourself and you know what you're talking about, that's the most powerful message of all, isn't it? Isn't yes. it? So with that said, credence, self-disclosure. Christina, would you take it away from here? Okay, self-disclosure in writing is an intentional, integral aspect of recovery. The importance of uses of self-disclosure, what aspects of your story should be kept personal, if any, and why, and how to handle possible contestations of the relevance of your lived experience and credence in the field being a professional writer and working to eliminate the mental health camps, which slow down the genesis of new knowledge and meaning making. And that's what Anna had said in the chat, exchange experience, that we have the right and the validity of sharing our experience, just like non-mental health peers do with the other people who are not peers. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, takeaways, the goal should always be creating space for diversity in peer support and mental health, working together and holding space for one another in our writing will promote and ultimately reform the discourse. So true. So true. Think about it. Why are we telling our story? Right? Are we telling it because we want people to walk all over us? No, it's to create space so people are like, all right, you're cool too. All right, your, your story means something. You're a person, you can exist, right? Yes. I mean, come on, it, it's about, so, so who you are is okay. And so you can be a part of the world and live amongst everybody else and feel okay about it. So when other people tell their story too, it creates a space for them. And when that person tells their story over there, a space, more space, the more space is the better because the more space we have, the, the, the more freedom there is for us to go up out there and do what we do and feel like who we are means something, that we're okay. Yes. Max, you know. Philip has a question. If you can touch on opinion, versus fact in writing. During a Recovery Coach Academy class three years ago, Ruth Riddick introduced the acronym, wait, why am I talking? And Matt, and he would like you to touch on opinion versus fact in writing. Oh, sure, sure. Well, there's a lot of mediums out there. And I guess the best way for me to address this is to say, what medium are you choosing to write? So like I have a blog, right? That talks about specifically my lived experiences. No one can say that I, I, those aren't my experiences. That's fact for me. Those are my experience, I lived that. However, if you're in an academic journal talking about a discourse as it is like the humanities or um, something like, you know, a, 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 um, something where there's academic, um, you know, literature behind it well then you have to speak within that discourse and align yourself with it and say hey look this is evidence that you folks are saying that i'm saying it's lining up so it must mean something it must be valid it depends on your medium it depends on who you're speaking with so if i'm talking to another peer about my lived experience no one's gonna say max you didn't crap in the toilet last night no i crapped in the toilet last night but you didn't crap it. I did. But if I'm in an academic journal, right, and I'm talking about crapping in the toilet, sorry to be vulgar, but maybe you listen, um, you know, they're going to be like, well, there's no literature behind you crapping in the toilet, Max. Where are your references? 
I, I don't see anything on Sight Factor. So maybe you didn't crap in the toilet. Maybe you crapped in your pants. Get it? So it depends on the medium. It depends on where you're coming from. I see you shaking your head. Believe you me, I speak from experience. You, you're walking uh, with people in their discourse. You have to speak their language. If you're not speaking their language, they're not going to listen because they don't understand what you're talking about. So I hope that answers your question. Now, here's the interactive piece. Here's the fun piece, as if it wasn't fun already, folks, right? Yeah, okay. Anyway, this is about sharing your story. This is about telling you how to go out there and do what you do as peers, right? And maybe have an article published or share, write, start a blog or take what you do, sit in your room and eat a cake or whatever you're doing, um, and, you know, and, and, and say, this is who I am. This is my experience. This is my blog about eating cake uh, or food. Uh, this is my blog about sitting in my apartment or, or maybe living with schizophrenia or having bipolar disorder or being manic every day. Um, you know, I want you to think about what it is you want to share, given everything that we talked about. Audience, your message, um, how, how convincing you want to be. Uh, the nature of what you're talking about, its content, and begin writing. Folks, write. Write, 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 write. That's how you do it. It's all practice. Right. We're going to take the next, what, 15 minutes, Christina? Yes, 15 minutes until about 1.05. Yes, yes. So I'm going to play this writing sounds music, and we're going to let folks write. And while we do that, I hope we all do that and start writing because after the writing period, we're going to start sharing our stories if you feel comfortable enough. And we're going to offer critical feedback on, on what you've written and how you've written it and maybe how you can improve upon it further. And I'm going to I'm sorry, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Sure. Okay. I don't go to the next one now.
Okay, Christina, where are we with time? Uh, about six minutes. Left? Yes. All right. Time? Uh, time, about three minutes. Okay, let's start wrapping up. I'm going to bring myself back to 
visual. Prepare for my visual. Okay. Fancy visual. Sorry, folks. No, we just see the graphic image. Now we can see you. Zah, we're back. We're back. Yeah. All right. It is time to share. So who wants to share what they've written? It's a big moment. Is it a big moment? Probably not. Maybe it is for you. It is certainly is for me to listen. Uh, I want to hear. I'm excited to hear. No pressure. Um, but if there is pressure, maybe identify why there's pressure. What's stopping you from sharing? And and what's, what's interfering with you being more public? And um, in case we don't get to your story, hopefully there's going to be an overabundance of stories we're going to listen to. Um, please send it in to me at mentalhealthaffairs.blog or to my, to my email. And I'm happy to work with you to get your story where it needs to be to get out there in a professional journal um, with me or someone else. I'm always happy to write with new, work with new writers who are interested in being more public about their lived experience. So with that said, let's share. I just wrote an outline. I don't know if that was the assignment, but I, I just did an outline. I haven't really fleshed out any uh, details. Okay. But I do have. But I do have a title. It's called "Hope in the Pit." Number one, why am I? Why I feel as though I'm in a pit? And then I put some examples: emotional stress, uh, physical stress, and then I gave some examples of the emotional stress that I'm going through, an example of physical stress. Physical stress, I mean something, uh, you know, physically happened to me for which I'm receiving treatment for. Okay, next part, number two, what keeps me going in the midst of my barriers? I uh, put music appreciation, watching TV, hanging out with my partner, taking short walks, engaging with people virtually, working from home whenever possible, taking cabs to doctor's appointments and other places whenever I can, stay connected to, to people by phone or Facebook and thinking about and reciting the serenity prayer daily. And then the last part, uh, the biggest takeaways from my life so far, I'm not alone. I have the means to connect with others. The only way to go, the only way to go after being down is up. People can relate to my struggles. I have self-worth. And a quote from the late Shirley Chisholm, if they don't offer you a seat at the table, bring in a folding chair. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Terry, you should publish it on mental health affairs. Bob. I agree. I agree. There's so much stuff there. You did so much great things. I don't know if you realize all the great things you've done. Beautiful. Um, beautiful. So, like, let's talk about some of that stuff that you did there. Um, so, like, it may have been an outline, but like it, it, it certainly is a vision of, of like, let's get to it. So there were recommendations. There were coping skills. If you want to frame it as coping skills, there were um, real life examples of how you get through and outcomes, right? There were outcomes. Did you hear that at the end? Positive experiences and the impact of, of using those skills and how it impacts his life and, and how the, the, the change that's created within that life and the new experiences, all right? There were themes, themes that can uh, be, you know, take on paragraphs, maybe not. Maybe they'll turn into questions, questions that will be answered. A lot of room there for growth and a lot of great stuff. My God, it's awesome, awesome. So, so the goal was to move from negative experience to positive experience Absolutely. because I know in my writing, uh, you know, that's, that's the goal uh, that I carry with me in my writing, you know, to move from the negative experience to the positive so that uh, people who read what I write can, you know, can walk away with some hope. Absolutely. And you did right. that. You did that so well. You heard about the, the, the plight, the struggle, and then what's done to um, interfere with that struggle and create growth and change and, and, and good things for you. Um, I saw a hand raised. Was there a hand raised for a second? Did you catch that, Christina? Um, I didn't see a hand raised. I see was one. It, yeah. That okay. was Laura. Yes. Right. Laura Bestnessia. 
Um, I started to write something. I didn't get to the good stuff yet, but um, this is the beginning of my thoughts. Awesome. Great. Uh, I titled it Surviving Suicide. When I woke up, I hadn't remembered what I'd done. Once I took in my surroundings, it all came back to me. One day I decided to kill myself. Suicide had always been a comforting idea, a way out if I just couldn't bear the pain anymore. At the time I decided to do it, it wasn't a particularly bad day. I just felt like it was time, time to remove the burden I was to my family. My mixed state bipolar disorder had immobilized me for years. I did nothing and experienced my emotions and thoughts in extremes. I had lost my self-perception of my identity and hadn't found a new one. Attempting suicide didn't bring me any closer to discovering my new self or learning ways to live with my mental health challenges. And then I thought I would go on to what did those things. Wow. Wow. I don't know if you, you want me to talk about all the great uh, devices and approaches that you took there. I mean, wow. Um, not only did you talk about the experience in, in like a very um, discreet packaged way, but you broke out from there and you broke out there with your feelings, your experiences and how those experiences shaped your thoughts. And then, and then it leaves us in a position where like, we wanna know what happens next. Very powerful, very moving. Um, it, it was as if we were living that experience with you. That's an approach folks, that's real. Yes, yeah. This is real, this is, you're hearing real stuff. And, and, and it's so exciting to hear that, you, you know, you're open to sharing it because it's gonna create spokes space for other folks with bipolar or or whatever experiences they hear from you and say, hey, I can talk about my experience too and I have a place in this world. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Folks, anybody? Does anyone there? else want to speak? Okay, Tommy. Um, okay. Um, there's one thing I've come to accept that's kept me from ruining the losses in life, and that's the knowledge that perfection is death. There's no change in perfection, no growth. There's none of the drama and struggle that marks for, makes for a living life. None of the errors that threaten existence that bring us close to the end. No chance for mercy to rescue the fallen. A life is a story, and all its moments, whether good or bad, bind it together. Looked at in this way, a person's life is a unique moment in the universe and an invaluable work of art. Wow. Wow. So that's- That reads like poetry in a way. Absolutely, absolutely. A lot, yeah. yeah. Really, like, there's so much there. It's It's- it's as if, um, you know, we're not so much following your thought process, but your feelings and 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 how this this like I feel I felt a stuckness. I felt a difficult plight that that's maybe not being overcome yet, or a process of overcoming this never-ending process of overcoming. And that speaks to me as someone who really likes to talk about how some stuff that sucks just sucks. And there's nothing getting around that, right? Sometimes shit is shit, right? That's why I used a vulgar example from before. Sometimes stuff that sucks just sucks. And I and it bothers me so much. That's my stuff where people are like, let's overcome, let's all be great in the end. Not everything is great in the end. And knowing that and sharing that with your peer and being like, hey, this might not work out for you. You should know that is so important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God, thank you. Thank you. Dean, would you like to speak? Okay. Hi, thank you. So um, I, I just wanted to respond to Max's question, what's um, at the beginning, well, just a couple minutes ago, what's preventing me 
right now. And one, I haven't thought about it, but as soon as he said that, what's preventing me? And just some things I jotted down, which I think we can all agree with are shame, perceived uh, weaknesses, um, false judgment by people, judgment by people. Um, case in point is Simone Biles right now, people are going online and saying that she didn't have the mental, um, uh, you, you know, she couldn't survive mentally in, um, right now through the Olympics. And that's why she, she got out. Um, also, uh, recently I had to write a paper for my uh, KSAC class about neglect, abuse, and trauma. It was a research paper, and um, having to write that paper wasn't about me, but it was more about research of that those topics, but it, it caused uh, me to think back. So those are some barriers that I might have right now to write, and maybe other people have had those as well. I would like to say something about talking versus listening, which is also useful for people in support groups. I think that sometimes you're at a point in your recovery where just listening to other people's stories can touch you and transform your recovery in ways that don't always happen when you're speaking. And in my recovery early on in the day programs, there was a mental health staff bias against people who were quiet and not speaking up in groups. And I think that does a disservice to everyone involved. So I understand and respect that at this point in time, a person might be a listener as opposed to a talker. And that could really be a method that helps them in recovery. Oh, Christina, beautifully said, and indeed so true. All of your reservations and concerns and, 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 and just everything there was so critical to what's going on in this discussion. Think about it this way. Let's start with that group piece, because I can imagine, picture myself back in um, a partial hospital, sitting in group and looking at everybody around the table some people are talking a lot, right? Maybe still hypomatic, whatever you want to call it, talking about their experiences a lot. They're getting discharged faster. And, and then I'm there just like listening. And it's, you know, my discharge, why, is that, why am I still in this group? I'm listening, I'm participating. Maybe I'm just, you know, hearing and using, you know, my reflective uh, tools and not speaking, but does that not mean I'm participating? Folks, it's like, that stigma is real and stigma is out there. And a part of being a peer is getting in touch with your experience and be comfortable with your experience. Um, and, and, and that may be listening. And that may be being that person who is reflecting on what their other peer is saying and giving them uh, advice or recommendations out of the spotlight and teaching them how to be that person who's out of the spotlight, because maybe that's your experience. You've been jerked over when you raise your hand and you speak. Maybe the teacher or the, or the professor, or the, in my case, or the, um, the person at the guest pub called you a jerk because you didn't use, you know, do it the right way. And that profoundly traumatized you. And maybe you want to talk about with your peer how sometimes staying out and, and being on the outskirts of things and on the periphery is how you work and how your life works for you. Because not being in the spotlight is not for everyone. Talking about yourself publicly is not for everyone. Um, sometimes it's about reflecting, being that voice and saying, hey, they want to think about that again. That whisper, you know, that helps a person reframe and be that support. It's all about who you want to be and how you want to get your message across. Because the message doesn't have to be public. It can be through another medium. But your, your concerns are very valid. It's a lot of stigma out there that needs to get shattered, whether it's you doing it on a micro level, face to face with someone, with your peer doing your work, or in a blog on the internet. You choose how you want to get your story across, but get it across. I implore you, get it across um, so someone, some way, <laughs> hears your message. Eustace would like to speak. Yes. 
Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, it's a, uh, I have a note here. It says uh, 50 years in the mental health system when all I needed was a good night's rest, but I will never know. I'm not saying that I was not, that I didn't have mental health challenges because I certainly did. But poor medical care, uh, by the initial analysis and the subsequent analysis led from the an original analysis that the, the subsequent doctors led continue basing their analysis on led me to be in the system for many years. Uh, in fact, uh, it may have even made me sick. But the point I'm making is I did have health challenges, but uh, because of an original analysis and then all the analysis based on the original analysis was not accurate, it led me to be in the system for many years, whereas perhaps if I was dealt with correctly, even though I did have challenges, I'm not denying that, it had been a matter of months, but instead I ended up 50 years in the system. But the point is on a positive note, even though that has happened, my determination is to turn the 50 years into positive, into benefit. I don't know how, but that's my determination. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to express. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was powerful. We heard struggle. We heard doubt. We heard, why is this still happening? Why? Why, why, why? You know, like, so, there's no answers, always. Um, I like to tell stories that maybe we'll get something out of it, maybe. But that's not always the case. And sometimes doubt and leaving it in a place of uncertainty is huge because there's so much uncertainty in the mental health system. There's so much uncertainty to where this field is going and we are as people. Do you know who you're going to be tomorrow? Do you know what's going to happen to you tomorrow? Either do I. Uncertainty, folks, it's huge. It's big. It's a device. Thank you. Anybody else, folks? <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Dean, did you want to speak again? I see your hand is still up. Uh, no, am I supposed to take it down? You can take it down if you know how. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry. Ah, okay. You don't have to apologize, but I understand why you're apologizing. Get it, Dean? Thanks. Okay. Does anyone else want to speak? If not, if not, we'll start. Move, we'll continue to move along towards our conclusion. <coughs> All right, you can interrupt me still with your story um, and interject. We're going to keep moving along for the sake of movement and forward motion. So, folks. What are the next steps? Where do you take this information? Are you going to shove it in your pocket? Are you going to be like, wow, Max's presentation was pretty awesome. Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, maybe. Um, or maybe, you know, Christina saves it, as she always does. Thank you, Christina, for being here today. But if you enjoyed today's workshop and you love writing and talking about mental health uh, and the peer experience, I encourage you folks to join me at my blog, Mental Health Affairs, uh, mentalhealthaffairs.blog. Look it up now. Take a look. You're on your computer. Poke around there. There's so many stories, uh, so many, so many uh, ways of participating, so many ways of becoming a writer um, and getting mentorship. I'm always willing to mentor people um, to become more comfortable with being who they are, becoming better writers, becoming uh, better ways of advocating through language. I'm here with you folks. So use this as an opportunity to join me. Um, or if you don't want to join my blog and don't like that message, folks, I'll help you align yourself with another resource. I want you folks to do what you choose to do and empower you to do it as long as you're doing it, right? I want there to be growth. And if you're not ready for that too, let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. So I want to think about this. Far too many stories and firsthand accounts of recovery are terminal and end with a cure like we talked about. Um, my blog doesn't, um, others might, some do, some don't. 
and and there's a lot of doubt and there's collateral pushback sometimes friends sometimes family sometimes they're like no you're not ready to get discharged no you're not ready to go home no you're still sick no you're still bad no you're this no you're that and the self-doubt and shame that comes from hearing other people tell us who we are and how we are and and where we are with things because i know when someone else says well you're this that that max you this and that i'm like that message starts to trickle in and i internalize it i'm like why does that person think i'm still sick am i still sick yeah that no i'm not and i have to override that message and create a new narrative and that's what this is all about the narrative is the message that you're giving to your peers that you're proclaiming to the world or maybe in a side conversation at the side in that one-to-one hey you may want to be careful that person's a jerk they're going to shame you and and you may not believe me you'll find out for yourself and here's some tools on how to deal with it you know or is, is it that intervention that you threw as a peer what is it and why are we doing this I believe that it's about never surrendering to our illnesses or diagnoses, whatever you want to think of it. I know I suffer from schizophrenia. I believe it is a, I believe it's a lifelong illness. And if without treatment every day and being attentive to my um, disorder, um, I will slip back at every moment. It's like I'm fighting an uphill battle at all times, all times. And if I don't keep fighting, I will relapse. And that, that momentum that keeps me going is knowing that if I stop, it's over. And I'm not going to stop because it's not going to be over until I say it's over. Because I want to have power. And by taking my power back through narrative writing is, is what I am offering you folks today to take away from this. And I would like to say something here, Max. Sure. About my own memoir, Left of the Dial. I didn't publish it because I thought that everyone should be able to do what I've done or could do that. I wanted my goal to be to empower readers to dream of having a better life despite facing a disability or having challenges. Because even though you have a disability or have a challenge, your life has not ended. Your recovery has only just begun. And I co-opted the term having a full and robust life in your own guise or state of being in recovery. And each person's recovery is as individual as their thumbprint and and that's a good thing that everyone is a true original and their stories are valid. Your stories are integral to tell other people and to tell yourself, most of all, when you're looking in the mirror, to give yourself a pep talk, to keep going every day and don't give up the fight. Right, right, so true. And if we're not being authentic with our voice and our message, why are we speaking? And what I wrote in a journal entry two weeks ago is that when you dare to be yourself, to own your identity freely and proudly, it's then the stigma carries no weight. By acting true to yourself, you'll impress the only people you need to impress in truth there is freedom so well said christina thank you thank you there's always truth in freedom in freedom and truth um and that's something that i'd like to help you folks further with if you give me the opportunity if not please um write to me and and tell me a better way i'm always open to listening how i can improve uh telling folks how to share their story and being their authentic self that's authentic me um, saying that I'm not perfect, obviously, and not because I have a mental health this or that. It's because I'm growing and we're all growing. It's a journey, folks. Join me on my journey or, or don't. Either way, um, I've, I'd like to thank you for coming here today um, and, and, and encourage you visit the blog, uh, listen to reread the takeaways. 
Um, hopefully we'll be sharing this in other mediums because that's what it's all about. Folks, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christina. you for your bravery too. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christina, for, for facilitating with me. Thank you, everyone thank who's you, shared. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, you. Don't give up the fight. Keep the struggle going. Stay on your journey. And when you go wayward, ask yourself why. Ask yourself, how do I get back on course? And is this just another <clears throat> message that is going to get shared another day? Because there's always something, folks. Always something. I look forward to hearing about that something tomorrow. Take care. Be well. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Bye.